Amen. Everyone said, Amen. You, you have any of you have these those people in your life that are negative, pessimists, always see the gla- the glass half empty, right? And it's just like you see them and they're always walking around like uh, something's always wrong, something's always hurt. You know what I'm talking about? Always walking with something. What happened to you? I stubbed my toe. They didn't tell you that they're kicking stuff. You know what I'm saying? But, but I don't know if any of you have ever had those people in your life, and when they get around you, it just kind of gets on you, and you get depressed, and you're just like, Ugh. You could have woken up in the morning having, like, this awesome day, and then you, you see these people, and you're like, oh, man, did you really have to go to Safeway at the same time? And you already know the conversation, right? So you, you, you got to do kind of like the human thing to do. Be like, hey, how you doing? And you're like, oh, I just, it slipped. Because you know what's about to happen. You ask the infamous words. How are you doing? Oh. (laughs) Now, I'll be honest with you. I actually don't mind that because I love ministering to people. I love ministering to people. So I actually don't mind it. I get excited when someone's like, oh. Because I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm going to pray on you. We're going to get you healed up. We're going to get you set free, right? But you, you guys know what I'm talking about. That feeling that you get. Just the bearer of bad news. Growing up, my dad used to always say, Son, I got some good news, and I got some bad news. Which one you want first? I, I don't know. <laughs> it depends what the ramifications are. You know what I'm saying? I want you to understand, the reason I share that is because I want you to, I want you to get this in your spirit. The gospel is not mixed with good news and bad news. The gospel is all good. The gospel is all good. There's not like this hint of bad. It's all good. And we have been called to be bearers of the gospel. That means inside of you, in your life, in what you do, and how you live, you are a spreader of the good news of Jesus Christ. It is good news. Look at that person next to you and say, good news. No bad. Good. Say it one more time. Good. It's good. All right. Let me do a review from Wednesday night. Some of you guys are paying attention. It's like, man, that dude is like super animated. What's wrong with him? (laughs) It's funny you should ask. It's kind of born this way, but we're going to get into the Word. You guys ready to get into the Word? To review a little bit of what happened, when Jesus said that this has been fulfilled in our hearing, that means that I have arrived. Jesus stepped into the scene and He said, I have arrived, which means this, heaven has invaded earth. The kingdom Come, the kingdom of God has arrived. Jesus got up and He said, today, this message is fulfilled in your hearing because everything that this message says is in me. I have come to do. You see, you can't have a gospel without Jesus. It's just impossible. You can't make up something that even equals out to who Jesus is and what He's done. He is the Messiah. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of the lords. And this is the good news of why Jesus... See, a lot of people don't think Jesus was the Messiah. Unless you come to a point that you recognize that Jesus was all God and all man. He was the Word. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in the beginning. And the Bible says that Jesus... The Word became flesh and dwelt among them. He was not just a prophet. He was not a good man. He was not an ordinary man. He was not just a healer. He was not a monk. He was God in the flesh revealed to you. Jesus was God revealed. When Jesus showed up on planet Earth, planet Earth experience the fullness of the person of God. Jesus was the fullness of God. He is the fullness. Are you understanding? He's not a portion. He's not one-third of God. 
He in the flesh was the fullness of God revealed to you. If you don't believe that, you can't receive the gospel. That's why the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, believe in your heart, God raises from the dead, you shall be saved. Because recognizing who Jesus is, is the very foundation of the gospel. Until you can recognize that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, that he came to seek and save that which was lost, you can't receive him the way he needs to be received. You can't receive Jesus as just some good teacher. He's more than that. You can't receive Jesus as a part of some other religions that you've added to your cart. He is the only Savior. He is the only Lord. He is the Messiah, the promised one that arrived here on earth to fulfill the promise of God. You see, this is the wonderful thing. When Jesus arrived, it was a demonstration. Jesus, kingdom of God coming to earth, Jesus was a demonstration of God's love. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Jesus coming to earth was not by happenstance. It was purpose for God to demonstrate His love to you. Secondly, Jesus coming to earth was also because it was God's desire for us to be reconciled unto Him. I'm going to read a lot of Scripture this morning because I want you to have a biblical foundation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 says this, as this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ. Now listen, because sometimes we get excited about that, but do you recognize the heart and the intention of God? It was yes to demonstrate His love to you, but it was also to draw you near. Jesus draws us near to God. He establishes, reestablishes relationship with God. You see, that's why you have to believe in Jesus. Because it's only through Jesus. It's not through your works. It's not through your church attendance. It's not through all these other things that you can obtain right standing with God. Righteousness is found only in Jesus because only in Him He makes us righteous with God. He reconciles us to God. And that is why God sent Jesus because it was His desire, not your desire, not your intention, because while you were yet sinners, you were unaware. You couldn't even understand or comprehend the love of God. And He invaded time and space because He desired to connect with you. Jesus and His arrival. His arrival is the one thing, the first thing that we have to believe in order to receive the gospel. But secondly, in order to walk into the fullness of the gospel, we have to receive His death. Whoa, Jesus. It's about His death. Let me tell you what I'm talking about real quick. If you guys can just bear with me for a moment. You see, every single one of us were debtors to sin. Every single one of us were bound. We could not get set free on our own. But see, the cross... Now, if, if you look at the Word, and many of you, again, I said I'm going to be using a lot of Scripture, so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is what? The power. It is what? The power of God. You see, the cross may seem like foolishness to some people that don't understand, but when we recognize that the cross was an offering of, listen, an offering of forgiveness, when Jesus went to that cross, you know what He was saying? I forgive you. All the things, all the debts that the devil wanted to cash in, Jesus came and He wiped your debt. And he doesn't remind you of your debt. That's the wonderful thing. You know, you, you ever have that friend, you let them borrow money? Or they let you borrow money? I, or, I'm sorry. They Christian borrowed you money. Like, no, I'll give it to you, brother. <laughs> well, praise God. And then two weeks later, like, hey, you remember that money um, that, like, I gave you? <laughs> what? And people call their debts in. And they have a, man, I'm telling you, when it comes to money, people remember 
<laughs> but you know, Jesus, the reason He went to that cross, the Bible says He became the propitiation. What does that mean? He took our place. He paid the penalty that was due your debt, your sin. He took it upon Himself and He forgave us. But we have to be very aware of this. That there is no forgiveness without repentance. Oh, wait a second. A lot of people don't want to hear that. Don't you think it's interesting that Jesus in Mark chapter 1, when He goes around and begins to preach the gospel of the kingdom, He begins to say, repent and believe. Why? Because fundamentally, repentance is a part of the gospel in receiving forgiveness because you cannot receive forgiveness without repentance. It's not that God can't forgive you. It's that you can't receive His forgiveness unless your heart and your mind has the ability to shift. Repentance is the shifting tool. Now, a lot of people say, well, believing is the shifting tool. Believing is a part of it. We have to believe that we are the righteousness of God. Amen? Can I get an amen to that? But that's not the full story. Because in order to receive that forgiveness, something has to happen in your heart. You know, the book of James, he's very clear about humbling yourself. As a matter of fact, he says, turn your joy into mourning, into sorrow. I want you to wail. Why? Because he understands the power of repentance. That's what he's talking about. Everybody get this? You sure? Everybody say the cross. The gospel is a message of the cross. Number three, the gospel must include his resurrection. As a matter of fact, the gospel is not the gospel if Jesus did not rise. If Jesus stayed dead, then the, then the gospel has no power. But I love how Revelation chapter 1, are you ready for this? This is word right here. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 says this, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And this is what listen to what Jesus says. And I have the keys of Hades and death. You see, the very reason that we that God has power is because He demonstrated His power. If He would have stayed dead, the gospel would have zero power. But the fact that Jesus is alive and death could not hold Him, that means that the very ultimate thing, which all of us see is the ultimate of ultimates, is death. Nothing can defeat death. But Jesus demonstrated His power in the fact that even death, which is this final thing, could not hold Jesus down. See, the Gospel receives its power by Jesus' resurrection. Without Jesus' resurrection, the Gospel has no power. Number four. His ascension. You guys remember that song? I got the love of Jesus down in my heart. Oh, we got some Sunday school kids up in the house. <laughs> Where? But you know, <laughs> you, can, you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You can believe that He died for you. You can even believe that He is risen. And a lot of people just say, well, as long as I believe those things, then that's great. But see, the problem is this. If you're missing components of the gospel, you're not walking in the fullness of the gospel. I want you to walk in the fullness of the gospel. Why? Because understanding the necessity to believe that Jesus also ascended into heaven. Now, a lot of people say, well, where's Jesus? Well, He's in my heart. Yes, I can understand what you're saying. Hypothetically, I can understand what you're saying. But Jesus, in actuality, the Bible says that He is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you, meaning standing in the gap. Do you know how powerful this is? Let me, let me give you an illustration of how powerful this is. Your prayers have no power without Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Your prayers don't work. Do you know why? Do you know why your prayers work? Is because Jesus is positioned where He's positioned. And that means, that's why when we pray in His name, things get done. Why? Because He is the intercessor. He stands in the gap. 
It's no longer about us. It's not about our name. It's not about who we know. It's not about what we can do. It's about His power. It's about His name. It's about His ability. It's about His authority. So if Jesus is not ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, then the gospel loses its authority. That's why we say it in this house all the time. I'll say it probably every week if I have to. The reason we still believe in miracles is because Jesus has not lost his position in heaven. Whew. By the way, just to kind of, this is just an underlying thing. Did you know that miracles aren't for you? The power of God is not for you. The power of God is for the gospel. I'll say that one more time because people think that the miracles of God, the power of God, all that stuff is for them and it's for the church. It's not for the church and it's not for you. It's for the gospel, wherever the gospel is preached. Are you guys with me? Come on. All right. You ready for number five? And this is the last one. Number five. His arrival. Everybody say his arrival. His death. His resurrection, His ascension. But lastly, this. And I'm a firm believer in this. You know, we can have all these things, all these four things operating in our life. But we are missing the fullness. Everybody say the fullness. The completeness of what God gave us. The entirety of what He's given us. We miss it in our life if we leave this fifth thing out. Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says it very clearly. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You see, the Holy Spirit was given to us as a fulfiller to help us walk in, but also to be a fulfillment of the gospel in our lives. Jesus himself, even before he started his ministry, he got the first things right. He went and he, he got full of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Spirit of God ascended upon him like a dove. Jesus made it very clear because, listen, all the disciples believed that he was Jesus, that he died on a cross. They watched him. Some of them watched him. Some of them saw him as the risen Savior and experienced him. They're about to watch him ascend up into heaven. But even Jesus, knowing that the disciples saw all that, Told them, now go and wait. Don't do a thing. First things first. Don't do a thing. I want you to go and wait for the empowering of my spirit. Because even Jesus understood that to walk in the fullness of the gospel, we desperately need his spirit. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. It's not your gifting. It is not your talent. Do you know why we put an emphasis in this church on the Holy Spirit? Is because it is his work in this house that does the work. So if I can get you to get filled with the Holy Spirit, I can get you to function in the fullness of the gospel. Can I get an amen? The Holy Spirit is not separate from the gospel. Can I prove that to you? Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 16. Now this is, because I want to prove it to you through the word. I don't want to just make a statement and be like, now believe it, you have to believe it because I'm your pastor. I want to make sure that you have biblical foundations for what you believe. Amen? Listen to this. This is what Jesus says. John chapter 16. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, everybody say the advocate, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, now listen to this, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. See, that's why I just said, lo, I am with you all the days of your I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because he gave us his spirit. He said, I got to go because this is not complete. That's what Jesus said. He said, look, if I don't go, now I could stay here. Peter, man, you need some help. I'm just going to stick around here, hang out. We'll just hang out, guys. Right? I'm telling you what, James, man, he cooked a mean fish stir fry.
But he said, unless I go, the gospel won't be complete. Jesus had to go so that the Spirit could come to complete the work of the gospel. Can I get an amen? You still with me? Now, now you say all that, you're just like, man, pastor, that's a lot. That's five points already, and you still got 20 more left. Man, we're going to be here all day. No, I'm just, I'm just, that's, no, no. But I want to tell you something, because a lot of us, we, we receive this information and say, well, now what, pastor? I got these five points. I believe he is the Messiah, Right? He died for me. He is the risen Savior. He's ascended. I understand the position of the Holy Spirit in my life to be a fulfiller of the gospel within me and through me. Come on. He's an advocate. But what do I do about this now? What's the product of everything that I just know? What, what is all this that I know, all this information, what does it produce in my life? I'm glad you asked. Because when we walk in the fullness of the gospel, when we take a hold of all five of these things and we apply it to our life and we believe it with all our heart, what it does is it changes everything in us. It changes what we believe. It changes what we see. It changes what we know. It changes how we live. Because your circumstance might say one thing, but the gospel says another. Your body might say some, one thing, but your gospel says another. So how do we apply this to our life? What, what comes out of knowing the gospel and believing in the gospel? It's this. We have a living faith. See, the gospel produces a living faith in you. It's not something you just say, well, I believe. Look, there's people, they sing, I believe I can fly. People try and jump off a building like, no, I believe I can fly. And they fall and they die. Just because you believe something, and even because you're sincere about something, doesn't mean it's true. But you see, the truth and the power of the gospel in your life, when you believe it, you begin to apply it. What happens is this. It does not just produce a belief system in your life where you say, well, I believe. It produces a living faith. It's not a faith that's stagnant, that you just turn on every so often like you do your car when you're going to certain events. Like, mur, 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 i got to go to church. Mur, 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 mur. It's with you every day. And it's a faith that is at work. As a matter of fact, James, Jesus' brother, gives us an understanding about the gospel and what it means to have a living faith. Everybody say a living faith. In the same way, in James chapter 2, verse 17, it says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. The gospel should produce a living faith inside of you. Verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without action or works is also dead. Do you know what's interesting is he begins to state within that chapter of chapter 2 of the book of James on how we should give to people, how we should bless people, how our faith is not just something that we keep to ourselves, it's something we live out. I'm sick and tired of being a pastor. And people say, well, my faith is personal. No! Your faith is a living faith. If your faith is not lived out in public, it's not true faith. But it also produces in us a living way. Oh, I like this one. I'm so glad I brought my moonwalking shoes today. Everybody say a living way. Are you guys still with me? Should I just stop right here and do just? Can I keep? Can I keep going? Because this, I like this one. So at least let me give this one. And I'll stop. No, I, no, I won't. But anyways, li listen to this. Listen to Hebrews chapter ten. Check this out. This is amazing. Hebrews chapter ten, verse nineteen. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, by a what? New and what? Living way open for us through the, through the what? Through the curtain. What is this saying? Through Jesus. 
Jesus became the curtain. That's why the Bible says no one can come to the Father except through me. Well, the reason the veil had to be torn, that veil that separated man and God from us entering into His presence, the reason it had to be veil, the veil had to be torn is because it was replaced. Because no longer, no longer do we enter into His presence through a veil. We enter His presence through Jesus. He became the curtain. Can I keep reading? And it says this, no longer enter the most holy place by the blood. We, we enter by the, by, by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way open for us through the curtain. That is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Everybody say draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. What is the writer of Hebrews saying? I'm so excited. Because there was a moment in my life where I was far off from God. I was stuck in my sin. I was broken. I was a piece of trash. I had no use. I had no worth. Sin had completely taken over and it destroyed my purpose. But God, in His wonderful mercy and His grace, Jesus came. He sent His Son to come and to reconcile me. A man that was far away from God and bring me back into right standing and proper relationship with God. If that doesn't make you excited, see, because this is what the living way means. It means that when I walk, I can walk with God. The sin that once separated me from intimacy with God has been dealt with. And now, in the living way, I can go into His presence any time that I want. It's not just a Sunday thing. It's a Monday. It's a Tuesday. It's a Wednesday. It's a Thursday. It's a Friday. It's a Saturday. And in KC, it's all day Sunday. A living way. We have been given a relationship, a tangible, real relationship with God that we can walk in and live. He talks to us. We can hear Him. We can talk to Him. Everybody say, the gospel produces a living way. He made a way where there was no way. Are you ready for this one? A living word. Man, I got some people excited up in here this morning. The gospel produces a living word. Can I tell you what I mean? See, this without the gospel is just words and pages. That's all it is. It's it's some good ideas that some good men put down on pieces of paper. But you see, when you understand, like I said before, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning, and that Jesus... It's called the Word made flesh dwelling among us. You see, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, everything that He gave us brought life to this Word. You see, this is not just pages. This is not just words on a page. This is not just a leather-bound book. This is the very living Word of God. (sighs) Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12 says this. You ready for this? For the Word of God is alive. Everybody say it's alive. What makes the Word of God alive? Is it the words? No, it's the Gospel. This book would have absolutely no power if it wasn't for the Gospel. The Gospel brought this Word to life. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When you begin to apply this thing into your life, listen, you're not just applying good ideas. You're not just applying principle. When you apply this to your life, it produces life in you. That's why when you obey this thing, your marriage will prosper. 
It's not because it's not just a good idea. It's not just a, a, a get rich seminar. When you apply this word to your finances, it produces life in your finances. When you apply this word to your body, it produces life in your body. Come on, I, 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 want, I want some of you to understand something. If I can get you to believe that this is more than just a book, if I can get you to believe that this is the very life that God has given us to chew on and eat on every day, and as you get into your word, you're not just reciting some good ideas, you are reciting the very words of God that have been declared over a people that He loves and have called in Jesus' name. You know what? I think I might just get this DVD. Anyways, everybody say he's at his last point. Now, <laughs> not only does the word, not only does, does the gospel produce a living faith, produce a living way, produce a living word, but lastly, the gospel produces a life worth living. The gospel produces a life worth living. Now I get I get so encouraged because as I look at Paul, the Apostle Paul, he makes this audacious statement. As a matter of fact, for the most part, if Paul would have made this statement today, we'd probably put him on crazy pills. We'd probably put him in some psych ward because he was so sold out to the gospel that it became the very part of his identity and purpose in life. Listen, listen to what Paul says. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. You ready? The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. The gospel. There's power. It's real. It's not a hoax. It's not make believe. It's not blind faith. The gospel is real. You know, you don't you don't even have to try and convince me that Jesus is real. You know, I know for a fact Jesus is real. You know why? Because I know this dude. Beside the simple fact that nobody in the last 2,000 years that have excavated in the areas of where Jesus' body could be put, spent millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of dollars, some of the greatest archaeologists on the planet tried to find Jesus' bones and his remains and can't find them 2,000 years. Beside that point alone, the very fact that the gospel is real is the fact that Glenn is saved. That he's changed. Because dude, you should have met this dude before he knew Jesus. His work in you is proof that the gospel is real. You know, this morning, if there's anything I could accomplish, it's not just to stir you up, inspire you. It's to begin to cause something inside of you to say, I want to walk in the fullness of what God has for me. I'm sick and tired of just taking portions of what I'm supposed to believe. I want to apply all of it. I want to apply all of it. The fullness of the gospel in my life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. All across this place. Whew. It's words like this that get me stirred up. What Jesus has done for us. Jesus did not hold anything back. He gave us the fullness of himself. God did not hold anything back. He gave you the fullness. God revealed the fullness of himself to us through Jesus. And when you receive... Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. 
when you believe in Jesus, you receive the fullness of what God revealed to mankind. When you receive Jesus, you receive healing. You receive freedom. Jesus. Some of you are here this morning. You say, Pastor, I'll be honest. I'm not walking in the fullness that God has for me. And I want to begin to walk in the fullness of His gospel. I want to begin to walk in a new level of faith, believing that Jesus is who He says He is. Jesus has done the work. And in that, I can receive everything that God has for me. If that's you, you know you're not living, you're not walking in the fullness of the gospel. You want to make a declaration today. Pastor, I want to begin to take steps to begin to see the gospel in full effect in my life. If that's you on the count of three, lift your hands. One, two, three. Come on. Well, oh, just lift them high. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not saying you're unsaved. There are times our belief system, sometimes our faith gets shaken, and we just got to learn how to continue to believe that God is who he says he is, that Jesus did what he did. With every hand that's raised, I want to ask all over this house if you'll do something with me. Will you just for a moment, every person here, will you say this prayer with me? Jesus, I believe in you. I believe with all my heart that you died for me, that my sins are forgiven, that God raised you from the dead, and you're alive. You're seated at the right hand of the Father. And I have power. I have authority. I have relationship. Not by my own strength. Not by my own works. But by the grace of God. Named Jesus. <laughs> and Lord, I receive it. I don't say this, just, just hold on. Some of you struggle with intellectualism. And you've allowed your theology and doctrine to determine what you receive from God. And you've missed out on receiving the fullness of what He has for you. But I believe that today, right now, many of us, all those blockades, all those hindrances can be broken off. Look, we don't have a spirit of fear anymore. And so right now, I want everybody in this house to say this with me, to end this prayer. Lord, I receive everything that you have for me. I will no longer be held back by my thinking, by my fear. But today, I declare that I'm going to walk in everything, in the fullness that you have for me. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give them some praise all over this house.